Greetings and salutations, all you absolutely stunning individuals. Welcome to another Epi Epi Dunlock here. The Mark here with Beauties. We're rolling onwards with some all time rankings. This time we're flying in to the island. We're talking top lane island. The kings of solo kills being abandoned by their team and suffering through lane swaps. That's all part of the resume of being a pro top lane. No wet noodle fights. This is all about the exciting action in top lane this time around, talking about the greatest to ever play the position. It's one of the more interesting ones, of course. We just you know came fresh off of doing the jungle and what they can provide and, and, and the differences throughout the time periods of players' career. You go to top lane, yes, there is that variance in the metas and how things are going, but it really is about how much individually you can offer, what type of game changer you can be on your own and then with the team is usually the combined factors that we talk about with these top laners and we've got no shortage of beauties to talk about on this list today and before we get to that top eight two main guys you really want to shout out that deserve recognition even if they're not within that top eight and that is both nuggery and marin two guys who at their absolute peaks you know they're amongst the very best of top lanes of all time the longevity just isn't quite there. I know Marin is a polarizing one because 2015 with SKT, he was incredible, but you look at any years outside of that and it's not nearly the same level. Nuggery had an incredible two-year stretch, but again, the longevity compared to the other eight, it's not there. Not enough runway, not enough numbers to be able to sit through and compare and stack them up to other other players, other careers, other story type of things with these two players. Marin specifically for me is one of these ones where he has the most magical one year that you can possibly think of from a performance perspective. And then it's not even close is the problem to being realized, to being matched up in any other future situations for him. And then you go to Nuggery and yes, Right instant, hot flash out of the pan with Damwon. Everything was fantastic. Even with some of the later struggles going to FPX and then coming back to Damwon, these type of things. Still an incredibly talented player. One of the innovators in the top lane. Full-on utilizers of Kleptomancy. Remember that one up there in the top side? He was one of the ones busting out and, and taking down that dirty strategy. Really love both of these players. But yes, you can't put them in to this type of list, slot them into these type of numbers. It'd be unfair to the career, the longevity, the success that has been continued by the guys that are on this top eight list. And you know, as a top laner, it comes with being able to play tanks and carries. And Nuggery, not a guy I associate with tanks. The Klepto, as you mentioned, and he was going full carry pretty much all the time. The first guy on this list is also usually on the carry unless it's a little bit of keen sante being busted out i know keen doesn't have the titles or accolades as many as most of the other guys on this list but for being on some bottom feeder not good Afrika and kwang dong rosters he was always the go-to guy and often the sole win condition the craziest thing to me is he's hovering around that, you know, 53, 55% career win rate is the one thing to look at. And it's been a long career for Keen, and it's been a long career in a lot of teams that are not the top runners, one of these contenders in the LCK. But there has never been a question about his capabilities, about his talent and what he could do on a team if it was a team that was built around championship aspirations seen that this past year on gen g what he's been able to do how much of a player how much of a factor he was able to be for them throughout uh, the run successes and failures is an important thing to keep track of with keen and this type of one but overall the longevity of his career the you know uh, understanding that he is an incredibly skilled player despite his surrounding situations a lot of these times keen has to have a spot on a list like this and you know still able to play some of these tanks even though he's more focused on a lot of the carries a lot of the time but so many different outplays over different years and eras again a pretty consistent peak for him and you know six plus years going back to that first world's run with the Frika and the mental fortitude that this dude has for having been on some pretty subpar teams in the LCK is honestly bonus points and why he gets to be on a list like this 
just ahead of him is another polarizing figure. There's a lot of polarizing top laners because you're either getting solo kills or getting solo killed very often. And that's why the name 369 is a perfect fit because when you're rolling nines, this guy has absolutely been one of the best top laners, not just in the LPL, but worldwide. He's had some dud matchups, but still, for the most part, even on star-studded rosters, he's been a standout. I love 369, but one of the favorite things about him is pretty much you get the name 369 and it dishes out what performances you can have on the day. You can have a three, which is the duds, unfortunately. You can get a six where he does have some contributions, but it's the not sixes are more rare. Seems to either be three or nine most of the time. Yes, because the six is where you get a little bit of contribution, but it is taking a back seat to someone else on the roster, finding that pop off. But occasionally and, you know, it's becoming a little bit more frequent as he becomes more involved as the option for the team. We're getting all of those nine performances and those nines are exactly why he is the threat in the LPL, why he is regarded as one of the best from China and what we can have in the top lane and the type of challenges and fights and duels that he has had against some of the very best. That is 369 and why he finds himself on a list like this. His champion pool is pretty darn big. He's willing to play anything. He can go all the way into the tank champion pool and he can go all the way into the into the carries as well. And that's what's most amazing about him is at times in his career, you've heard people saying, well, he's one of the best tank players. He's the tank player supportive guy. And then the next year you can go, well, no, he can actually play carries and be the guy on a squad. He's shown both angles. He can be a top three top laner in that respective meta. So being able to play both sides of it is what truly makes top laners stand out amongst the rest and why 369 deserving to be on this list. Captain Longevity is who drops in the sixth spot. I know you get negative points whenever a lot of your success is in the LCS, but Big Daddy Impact has done it in the LCK, gotten a couple titles, gotten that world championship before coming to the LCS, and now playing north of a decade. There's no question he has to be on this list. Oh, man. What a career Impact has been able to have throughout his time in the LCS and of course the beginnings back in the LCK as a world champion with SKT important to keep that one in mind because a lot of people need that type of reassurance that little extra golden nugget beside the name of impact when you're talking about his success in the LCS in order to qualify for a list like this because you laid it out the LCS we all know it. No need to, to be scared about it. It's not providing the same level of competition, excitement, value that you do when you get these performances in the LCK, in the LPL. So for Impact to be here and the longevity of his career is the big one. You look throughout all these years, how he has been, that stable option in that top side. This is more so leaning towards that tank part of the top lane when you're talking about Impact and what he can provide for a team. I think one of the things that you are, of course, looking at with him is the champion pool with those tanks coming on in. He can even, you know, change it up a little bit. Nar, right? Sure. Nar is okay. Saying Nar is, is special is is pretty much the... It's the, the least in thing. of top lane. You have to be able to play it, right? You have to be able to play it, but it's also the indication of, yeah. So if, he, if that's the special one, he's been playing a lot of tanks then because if Nar is breaking the trend... That's how it is. You can even throw in the Kennen, the Renekton in there for someone like Impact and what he's been playing, what he has been successful on. His career is one of the very best in LCS history. Got to put him up. Also had some pop-offs on the Gangplank in the LCS where he's taken over games. But you look at his history, obviously that SKT run, but he's played on Team Impulse. Remember that team? Yeah, they existed. NRG Esports before they were the NRG that was the contracts, Dokla era. He's been on Cloud9, Team Liquid twice, FlyQuest, Evil Geniuses, and the theme across all these LCS teams, you hear former teammates, whether it's Sneaky on Cloud9, inspired on EG, and they've said he is one of the best teammates, he just knows what to do and what his role is, and he knows what other people's role is and is telling them exactly he's one of the most cerebral players that we've ever had in the LCS. And much like Faker, the reason he's been around for so long is he just has such an undying passion for the game. You love to see it, and I think one of the best 
indications of talking about again what you just went through his work ethic and his passion for the game is any time since he has become the de facto grandpa the ambassador of the lcs to these imports coming over any import that's come over and has interacted with him international events all these sorts of things I only hear praise for impact and how he carries himself, how he's willing to teach, what his practice methods are, all these type of things, which in the LCS puts you in a rare category that we got to be talking about impacts career deserving of a top top type of list of the top one. The number five guy on this list when he retired, I, I think a lot of people thought he was locked in as a top two, three player on this list, and that is Smeb. But there's been some standout performances since then. But still, no question, 2016 right up there with Marin and Nuggery in terms of most dominant years by a top laner. And we had that for a couple of years after that for Smeb, which is why he's on a list and those other guys are not. Oh, my, my thing with Smeb is I wonder. I'm just left with the lingering question of his wonderful and, uh, you know, at times, absolutely scorching hot career that he was able to put through in the LCK. I'll remind you, at times, 2016, a lot of people were considering him to be the number one player in the world over Faker, heading towards that world championship. Of course, we know how that all plays out. Faker gets a, a nice little a somersault at Staples Center, picking up another world championship for himself. And Smeb still left without one of these ones for KT Rolster. Got to talk about KT Rolster because, again, this is someone who was loyal throughout his career, would stay, would not be the traitor to go over and deny and everyone else was going to T1. He stayed strong against the Empire in the LCK. His top lane performances were special. Rumble, of course, one of the big ones you got to be mentioning when you're talking about Smeb and how he was able to cook in that top side. But I'm left with that lingering question of the what if, because what if you didn't squeeze the orange so much throughout all those years uh, early in his career where we get the burnout, where we do get this retirement, where we could have had him maybe a year, two years longer. And what would have happened if he was able to experience some of the 200 years of Riot game design, champion design, and how top lane has truly exploded and taken over from what we used to know and expect as the standard options. When you go standard top lane, there isn't a better option for me than Smeb. But I am left with that question of what if he got to taste the radioactive goo that is current League of Legends. I mean, my man was cooking up the Riven, Irelia, Fioras before most people were playing it. So yeah, when you're able to play Gwen's and uh, who knows, Viego Top even, whatever <laughs> these crazy champions are. Yeah, Smeb definitely would have been cooking on some of those picks. But the guy ahead of him has been cooking in that era and the shortest career so far really that's going to be on this list it's another t1 member and zeus as soon as he came in as that hyped up solo queue god within basically a year you already had this guy in the conversation as a top three top laner in the world and it's important to take a little dosage of of your you know vegetables of your medicine here and remember just like 369 rolling a three everybody on this list the nature of the top lane role has some duds it happens yep. it's one of these things that can come through and we do need to mention that with zeus because we've had a couple of ups and downs but the ups are consistent and they're the highest of highest ups that you can get in the game of league of legends winning the world championship making it to the world's finals zeus what is left to say about the god of thunder one of the most skilled and outright gifted players that we have ever seen in the game of League of Legends, never mind position type of thing. And someone who knows it and sometimes pushes it a little bit too far in these type of situations to try and get that maximum effort, that maximum limit test that he can get to push it to the ultimate level 4T1. Zeus has been able to do that. His champion flexibility has been extreme and certainly had some questions, some doubts at times, but we have seen the development, the growth of it, the addition of a new champion here, new champion here. We're moving into this type of style, this type of meta. I'm gonna throw this little wrench in there and that's gonna be my style that I'm gonna roll through with it and be the disruptor. Zeus has been a phenomenal uh, character in the in the LCK, only denied pretty much by Gen G. Uh, domestically is the only way to look at his career. Uh, Gen G and DRX only 
the only little X's in there when you're talking about his success. And I know he's had some negative press about him. There was the finals. He's a choker. He's good up until the finals. But I think that was fully beaten away, especially 2023 Worlds when he not only 3-0's Weibo going up against the Shy, but picks up MVP for that series. And yes, he's got the... he's. Doran is his father, certain matchups that don't go his way, but still, for the most part, this guy has been a top three top laner on the planet ever since he became a starter, while being under the incredible pressure that is playing on a star-studded T1 roster, so absolutely electric start to his career, and he'll probably, much like these other young guns on T1, only climb higher on this list as he continues to play more games on the Rift, but for now... Zeus is not cracking that top three because we've got some longevity and high stakes matches for these big guys. Starting with another former SKT top laner. We're talking Khan, who did it on Longju, going all the way back to 2017 when he kind of came roaring onto the scene, store that, stole that mantle from Smeb. He did it on SKT. He was still great on FPX, even though the results were there. And then, of course, his final dance on Dom One, he got so close to that elusive world's title I'll, I'll be honest this is a really fitting option to go with right after Zeus because i'm not convinced that when khan stepped away from the lck to do his military service he didn't just you know touch a random mouse and transfer all of his energy <laughs> skill and mindset into that one and then of course who sat down at the pc next but Zeus, and he's the one that all that energy all that skill transferred into because khan really is an earlier Zeus, the way that they played, what type of champions, what type of roles they would play for the team, that type of, you know, I don't want to actually fully go that way because Khan is an individual. His personality was a one of one, really a special, uh, you know, a fun guy to have on a team that you would always see, but still someone who took everything incredibly serious with his practice, with the effort that needed to go in to be at that top level of competition. Khan, an incredible career if you go through all of the numerous stops that he had throughout his time this was one of the guys where you think you know okay you have an incredible player maybe he's going to spend all this time with one organization that's not how it was for Khan. he was taking uh, a year a two year a three year type of trip type of stay and then moving on to the next type of challenge to take on never ultimately getting that full championship that i think his skill set deserved throughout the course of his career but again, one of the best, one of the best and most grown up moments in League of Legends is when he loses the world finals in that game five and says, you know what? Yep. Blame me. It's all me. It's all my fault type of thing. Don't don't put any hate onto my brothers, my little brothers. Let them have a good time, good memories of this event type of thing. I'll take the heat. That's who Khan was at the end of the day. And the most LCK titles for a top laner, by the way, doing it with Three different squads, got it with Dom Juan, did it with SKT, did it with Longju slash King Zone, which I guess is technically two different organizations, but they were really the same, but absolutely elite across his career. Number two is where we get polarizing, because you either think the Shy is the greatest top laner of all time, hands down, no question, it's not even close, or you think he's 50-50 and a dirty inter a lot of the time, and truthfully, both sides of that coin are probably correct. Uh, you gotta you gotta realize you know you need sweet and sour right you gotta yeah. have both of these things in balance and that's what well occasionally it was imbalanced from the shy but uh, at the end of the day yes i think you can split it down pretty equally but you do need to respect both sides of it and to respect that even if the negative side exists to be able to bounce back to the positive side and for someone like the shy it's important to mention these bounce backs weren't always one game here, one game here, one split here. It wasn't like that all the time. There were extended stretches where it was more so this version than the other. And it mostly was that good, that dominant factor in the top side for what a lot of people remember is that IG success. That's the big one when you look at the shy and what he was able to do in the LPL. Yes, there are other successes there are other triumphs since then but of course the big one is that 2018 ig year one one of the most iconic plays in world's history is the big atrox knockup the big deletion of g2 ig the shy is the real deal 
And I think people forget that there is longevity here. He was amazing in 2018, but pretty much all through 2020, those three years, he was a premier top laner and must-see TV in most of their matchups. And I think the Weibo finals run really cemented him as on that Mount Rushmore of top lanes. And still, if you look up anyone's career highlight reel, nobody's hits quite to the same level as the Shy when he's reaching those peak out plays. One guy you could maybe have in that conversation for peak out plays is who is number one on this list. It is Bin. It is BLG Bin. It is Giga Bin. We thought that Sooning run as a rookie, okay, okay, maybe this is a flash in the pan for this rookie, but nah. Since he came on to BLG, it's basically three straight years that he's been the best top laner in the LPL. And and I, I it's, again, fantastic coming right off of the Shy because I think if you look at the Shy's career, and as you said, those 2020 20 years where he still is performing well, but the results don't necessarily line up because of how things were with IG and where the shifting top teams were in the LPL. You look at Bin's career, and he's had what the shy didn't in those periods where he's able to get right onto the scene grab your attention just like the shy did 2018 but he's going to be able to keep it going is the biggest thing with ben and his gameplay his environment that he is surrounded in i think there is an extra level to ben as well that steps him above the shy and it just is there is nobody on this list and we've talked about it we've said this word to, to describe him type of thing there's nobody that's as dominant as been as oppressive as he is as this ruler of the top lane when you're stepping into his uh business zone he is incredibly lethal on the flanking situations in any of these team fights individually able to generate massive advantages in that top side he's able to withstand massive pressure in that top side as well and not give over those advantages to the enemy team bin is a terrifying terror in the top side bring out the jacks we know that, yes, Zeus might have got one little X against it with the Gragas performance recently, but there's a heck of a lot of Ws in that Jax's win column, and that is a scary sight. Nobody puts more pressure before even hitting the Rift, whether it's that Jax, the Camille, the Fiora, everyone's sweating, seeing Bin opposite. What do we have to ban out? Because we do not want to mess with this guy in a side lane, and there's still time for him to go even higher on this list with such a young career to his name so far. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beauties. Thanks so much for hanging out.